By the end of this video, you should know everything you need to know about how to calibrate your resin 3D printer. I'm gonna break down this video into three major chapters. The first one's gonna be how, the second one's gonna be when, and the third one is going to be why. For me, unless I understand the why, I have a really hard time remembering the how or when or anything like that one. So for those who wanna stick around to the very end, you're gonna learn a lot in this video. And so with that, let's get going. And just real quick, I've noticed a lot of you haven't liked or subscribed to our YouTube channel or even tried out Leitchi Plus or the Leitchi Library. So if you wanna see some more of these guns, like and subscribe now so you can keep this channel going and you know, keep seeing more of this. For this first section on how, it's gonna be broken apart into two main chapters. The first chapter is gonna be the boxes and the second one's gonna be about the pillars. Unless you listen to both, you're not gonna have a very good calibration, so stay tuned for this entire segment. But first, we're gonna talk about only the boxes and how they're designed to work. What they do is they are a dimensionally accurate calibration part, and they're pretty easy to use. You're just gonna snap off the boxes and stack them inside of each other, kind of like this, and it's kind of fun. You can hear it if you don't drop it. And then it should stack right inside of each other. It can be hard to show this on camera. And then we'll snap it again. And then the, the basically there's a four millimeter, a six millimeter, an eight millimeter. The eight millimeter doesn't snap off, it stays on the plate. The other two snap off and they go inside. And the way they work is like this. So if you snapped them off and they just slide right in there like they did, and there's a little bit of wiggle, and here there is, it's like a loose tooth kind of a wiggle. That means that right now you don't have enough UV exposure time. So what you're gonna do is you're going to increase the UV exposure time if it's a little bit of wiggle, I'd do like maybe 0.2 seconds or 0.1 second until you get to a point where there's no wiggle, but they're also not tight. We don't want to force these things in like we're just pushing really hard. If I push really hard, I can get to the stack. Ugh. That would be uh, overexposed. If that's the situation, you're going to want to lower the UV exposure time until we get that perfect feeling. And this is where we're going to focus on section two of the chapter, the pillars. So what the pillars are telling us, they're going to tell us how much strength we have at dimensional accuracy. Again, the boxes are the control, the control making sure that our, uh, we're not overexposing, and the pillars making sure we're getting the most tensile strength out of our calibration. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to add line off delay. That's going to make the boxes shrink. We're going to add UV exposure time. That's going to give us more pillars. Of course, there's a point where there's diminishing returns, where the print time is getting crazy, and we're not getting much more tensile strength. So generally what I do is I'm doing this little game of uh, adding a uh, light off delay, adding exposure, adding light off delay, adding exposure. I'm really only doing that maybe twice total. If you wanna do it three times or more, that's up to you. You do you and try to get the best calibration possible. But for me, I usually end up, I've, I've kind of found that for most resins and most printers, you're gonna be somewhere between two seconds and four seconds light off delay. And that's gonna allow you to get a lot more UV exposure time and get a lot more tensile strength. But anyway, that's how you use boxes of calibration. You make sure the boxes fit while getting as many pillars as you can. What you don't do is just get as many pillars as you can regardless. And let me show you a reason as of why. And that is because if we're using a high quality, generally a little bit more expensive resin, they're very tensile strong. And this is a good example right here. I have 10 out of 10 pillars, something not all resins can even do even when they're slightly overexposed. However, this one is underexposed we have an additional 0.3 seconds of UV exposure time I can apply per layer before this thing is fully formed, I mean just dimensionally accurate. Because right now these are too small, they kind of wiggle and they'll just fall right out if I shake it. If I just printed as many pillars as I could, well, that would be wrong because I wouldn't have gotten the most strength I could have gotten out of this resin. So that's why we don't want to just focus on one or the other. Both of these aspects on this calibration part are designed to work together. And now for the topic, when should you calibrate? To help me out with this one, I printed someone who loves to calibrate pretty much 24 seven, a man of my own heart, I guess I should say. This little model right here is Garrus from Mass Effect, uh, well, one, two, and three. A really cool character who just always wants to calibrate the engines. So as you can see, these haven't been post cured yet, but they have been sitting around for a little while, so let's see what they do. I wanna rip these directly off the supports and just see how well this model uh, really assembles using multiple different resins. Uh, let's just see what happens here. So I only get one take of this, so hopefully I don't screw it up because I'm not gonna print them again just for this uh, take. Uh, as you can see, these supports come off great. And it doesn't matter if you're printing minis or if you're printing, you know, like engineering parts or dimensionally accurate or models that need to be assembled. This calibration method that I just showed you works for all of the above. It's, it's really awesome. All right, let's see here. Let's get the gun out there. We got some terrain. There we go. 
Now, as you saw, I wasn't careful at all when I ripped those supports off. I did it quite violently. So what we're gonna do now is just quickly glue them together and just kind of see how it all fits, where pretty much the only thing we're relying on is calibration to save us. And there we go, Garrus over here from Hell Creator turned out really awesome. Uh, especially since I was very violent in the way I ripped off the supports. I intentionally didn't, you know, heat them up or warm them or put them in water. I really wanted it to be a struggle to try to get this done. So the only thing I was relying on is, well, the calibration. But we'll set him here while we go on to the next topic. And that next topic is when should you calibrate? And the answer is pretty much always. If you copy your settings online, if you haven't calibrated them, they're not going to work as good as they could, even if they were really good settings. This is because your printer is unique, your room in which you're printing is unique, the temperatures and everything is going to be slightly different. This is why everyone must calibrate their resin to their printer every single time. The good news is, is once you've calibrated your resin to your printer, it's pretty much good for the life of the printer, except for a few exceptions. Let's go over those now. The first exception would be if you change the layer height. Let's say you go from 50 to 40 or 30 UM on the layer height, you're going to have to recalibrate for every single layer height. The next reason would be for drastic temperature changes. This is why we like to put heaters in our printers. The importance of a heater is that it maintains a consistent temperature across the time or the cycle of the print, not just the temperature gets high or then hot because that can change the exposure time required. So if you live in an area where it gets hot or cold, day or night, winter or summer, you might have to have more than one calibration uh, setting for each of those temperature changes. But again, a heater can pretty much mitigate that one if your printer is in such an environment. And the very last time you may need to calibrate your printer again is about every six months if you use your printer quite a bit. If you hardly use it, don't worry about this. But if you're someone who prints every day or let's say three or four times a week, over time, the UV light source is going to dim out, kind of like a projector bulb that needs to be changed out. It'll get dimmer over time. All you need to do is just throw boxes of calibration on an existing print. You don't have to do it standalone. If the boxes are kind of loose and wiggly again, it's probably time to recalibrate. And now we're to my favorite part of the video, which is the why. To help explain that, I created this fun little document with some cute little pictures. We'll put a link in the description so you can download it and look at it on your own. But at the end of this, I really think you're gonna learn a lot. So stay tuned to the end. The first slide here is titled, Not All Accuracy is the Same. And here we've got pictures, two pictures of boxes of calibration. The one on the left is missing four pillars. The one on the right has 10 out of 10, or it has all the way up to the S tier pillars. So. What's different? Well, they both measure, I assure you, both of these pictures are boxes that measure perfectly. They fit into each other, they're not too tight, they're not too loose, and they measure within 0.04 millimeters when I use digital calipers. So let's scroll down and see if it helps explain what's going on here. If I scroll down, I can see the one on the left used 1.3 seconds and the other one used 1.8. So a half a second more at, and these are printed at 30 UM, which is almost getting kind of close to 50% more exposure time. That explains how we got more pillars, but that doesn't really explain why the boxes still fit. If anything, the boxes should be really big and they shouldn't fit anymore. Well, the difference here is, again, I used light off delay. This one had zero seconds, this one used 2.5 seconds light off delay. Using that light off delay made the boxes shrink uh, in all dimensions, so I was able to increase the UV exposure time, getting more pillars. And here we just got a zoomed in picture of the pillars. You can see uh, that one is missing four and that one has all of them, and they're looking pretty good. Now that's great, but how does that apply to the real world? Well, right here we've got a picture of this calibration part. It's not a calibration part, sorry, of this kind of like a fun little test print. And the size of what you're looking at on screen is like the size of like my pinky nail. Actually, probably, uh, yeah, about the size of my pinky nail. It's very, very small. This is also printed on a 45 degree angle, so it's designed to be kind of tough for the printer. And so the ones that are printed like straight up, this is designed to kind of challenge things a little bit. So here we can see that although everything measured perfectly, we didn't get the small details. Now you may be printing big stuff and think, well, I don't care about small details, I print big stuff. Well, trust me when I say half a second of UV exposure time different is gonna be a lot of tensile strength and the big stuff, well, it cares about it more than the little stuff does because there's a lot of weight and cross sections on those big prints. Trust me, it applies to you as well. But if we see over here on the other one, what does it look like with properly calibrated resin? Well, all the small details, and again, these details are very, very tiny. This is very much magnified in. Uh, printed as well as we can still see some of the holes over here from some of these pillars This is a very challenging print and it did really really well Especially when we consider this is the RPG resin designed to be slightly more flexible Not necessarily what I would call a uh, high tensile strength or high accuracy resin 
And if you look to see how that changes with these numbers over here, of course, the, the letters are on the other side. This has three sides of it in total. On uh, the side that's properly calibrated, uh, both the indent and the outdent are nice and crisp. A lot of good details. Over here, we can see a lot of stuff didn't print, and the indented layers look more like they're cratered out. They're, they haven't even fully formed. So definitely underexposed. Now this brings us to the next section. If you're only focused, or if we're only focused on calibrating X and Y for like dimensional accuracy or whatever we're doing, we might miss Z. Now if we look at these pictures over here, this is the one that came from the one that was underexposed. And of course, without context, it makes no sense. So let me show you the one that was properly calibrated. Remember, this one's underexposed, um, but everything measured dimensionally accurate. Over here, this one looks quite a bit different, and you might not notice the differences at first. Let me highlight them for you. See this row of circles down here at the very, very bottom? They're completely missing from these ones. In fact, if I were to uh, count these uh, circles going up to the top in that like kind of dice pattern, this one's missing an entire row that this one has. What we're suffering from here, we call um, layer compression. If we look at the title of this one, proper calibration also prevents missing layers known as layer compression. So this can be a complicated topic, but it's not a topic you even need to worry about or fully understand if you're calibrating properly in boxes of calibration because they force you to use the proper weight off, uh, the proper light off delay or wait before print times. I mean, they force you to do it. All this is going to automatically just get done for you. So if you care about it, the test is right here on the side. You're more than welcome to look at it. It's kind of small, maybe the magnifying glass or your phone. But just know that uh, it's there if you want to test it, but you don't have to. Just follow the steps I said in the very beginning of this video, and this is going to work itself out automatically. Now, also, if you're wondering why this matters, it doesn't just matter for the very bottom layers in the raft that can not stick to the build plate, cause failures, but it can also happen on larger prints or bigger prints. Layer compression affects layer basically zero or one all the way until you're done. So if you're not calibrating properly, layer compression can bite you in the butt. It can look like split rafts, polished rafts, uh, where you're like you're, you're printing your support, start printing, all of a sudden they just stop for no reason. You can't figure it out. All those are not, they're not 100% a sign of layer compression, but they like 95 or 98% of the chant time that you get a failure like that. Layer compression is the culprit. Again, calibrating properly just makes those problems automatically go away. Now, the next thing proper calibration can do is prevent you from doing uh, false positives. And that's, well, here's the example here. This is the Sun Lu Red Wax and the Hyperfine uh, Frozen Blue. And both of these have 10 out of 10 pillars. So if I were to calibrate my resin based on, hey, pass this difficulty test, this toughness test, and make this object print, if you just did that, I'm telling you right now, you would have not have been properly calibrated. These are actually underexposed by 0.3 seconds per layer at 30 UM, which is quite a bit. And how did I know that? Uh, I mean, everything looks great. They look actually quite fantastic. Well, I knew that because the boxes didn't fit. They were wiggly. Remember I talked about earlier, like loose tooth. So what I was able to do is increase both of these by 0.3 seconds and get the proper calibration. And I'll show you what those results look like. We saw what the red clay, uh, we saw what the RPG looked like. Here's the other two resins. They are really good. Uh, this one is very accurate, very beautiful, but uh, nothing quite compares to the Hyperfine Blue. I think this is a very, very accurate resin. Again, I would have been underexposed if I just followed uh, some sort of strength test or pass test. I had to know that I hadn't reached dimensional accuracy yet, and I had to keep going to get results this good. And of course, it may seem like I'm just showing off right now, but I didn't calibrate these. These are the results I just happened to get by doing proper calibration. And again, I think these look absolutely fantastic. But there's another type of calibration that can give you a false positive, and that's these like flat ones here. Now, these pictures you're about to show you are from my own calibration part. This is like the build plate, um, sorry, this is the multi-cure calibration for doing like, you know, multi-cures on a single plate. Now on mine, I did take some extra care and I made it so that these little holes on the side here actually have a groove out of the back. That way the bottom layers or burning layers don't affect it. This is also much thicker than a lot of the other ones out there, kind of lifting the test away from those bottom layers. So just know that the what you're looking at right here is not a result of improperly calibrated bottom layers or burning layers. It's a result of improperly calibrated normal layers. So right here, we've got four pictures of pins and holes. At the top one, the pins printed beautifully and the holes also don't look too bad. In fact, I think for most people, especially on the blue one, you'd look at that and think, I'm done. I'm actually good to go. And on the red one, you might lower the UV exposure time, which would be the wrong thing to do. 
And if you looked at the blue one and thought you should lower it too, again, that would be the wrong thing to do. Because looking at the bottom ones, would you believe that the bottom pictures here have more UV exposure time than the top? Uh, and again, the difference between the top and the bottom is just light off delay. Adding that light off delay allowed me to increase UV exposure time and get finer details, um, and not just finer details, but actually, you know, get these holes a bit more open, which using pins and holes is a calibration method we all, I think, are used to using. But if you're just using that calibration methodology, you might struggle to do the right thing. And of course, you're not gonna know exactly how much light up delay you need to use. Uh, I'm sure you could maybe like add it and guess it using this information, but it's gonna, I think it's gonna be a lot more difficult. And again, when we look at Z, some of the issues that maybe not be apparent like up here when we're just looking at the, you know, straight down these flat parts, when we start looking at Z, we start getting a little bit more information that something's wrong. Here on the left, you can see that bottom layer of, of holes is pretty much just crushed out on both the blue and the red clay. But it's the second we properly calibrated, it fixed some of the issues we had on Z as well, even on some of the really, really accurate resins. And as it says here in the bottom, I'll just read it off to you. Unless you're calibrating your resin using a methodology that will cover everything, you are not getting the true potential out of your resin or your 3D printer. There's one other thing I wanted to mention that's a little bit out of context for this video, but I know I'm gonna get asked it anyway, so here it is. What happens if your printer has lots of light off delay, you're using the right settings, but you still just can't get the boxes to fit or you're not getting a lot of pillars? Well, there's a few reasons for this one, and what I always tell people is the boxes don't lie. And I've helped a lot of people with this one, and we've almost, I would say almost 99.9% .9 of the time, found out there's an underlying issue with the printer or the resin that they're using. Sometimes they're in a really cold environment, so cold the, the resin really can't form. Sometimes the printer is in pretty bad shape. The release film is scratched, it's damaged, the LCD is covered in resin, it's very dirty, or the Z screw is in really bad maintenance. So make sure if you're having problems that your printer is really clean, like brands make a new clean, you've got uh, your, your release film is in good working condition and that you've continually to maintain your printer. Also, again, make sure that you're printing in an environment that is over 22 degrees Celsius, but for most, if you can keep it under 30, that's also the best as well. And the last thing that I've noticed, if you're using water washable or uh, like eco resins, they tend to not have as much accuracy or tensile strength. For those ones, we're generally not gonna get as many pillars as we could on like an ABS-like or some other of the fast, higher quality resins. Not to say it's impossible, it just, for some of them, is a little bit more difficult. And I think that about covers it for this one. So I hope at this point, you know a lot more than you did at the beginning of this video about calibration and how it all affects everything. But how if you do it properly, you really don't need to pay attention to pretty much anything that I talked about in the last chapter of this video. You only need to follow the instructions that I talked about in the very beginning, and all that other stuff is just gonna magically kind of resolve itself and disappear. And as always, if you could, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, join us on our Lightshade Slicer Discord, or comment below if you have any questions, comments, or snide, snood, snide remarks, one of the three. And as always, thank you for watching, and have a good day.